So welcome back, everybody, to our second segment. And very good friend on the show. And believe it or not, he third book. I, I'm sure you have uh, remember from previous shows, author Stephen Knapp. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Glad to see you again, yeah. Robert. <laughs> I'm just totally astounded, you know, that uh, you've actually authored and published 23 different books. Well, you know what they say, all work and no play makes books. Ah, okay. At least that's my motto, <laughs> yeah. you know. No time to dilly around. But this is Life a great pleasure short. for you, right? You love what you yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. I like what I do. I like, you know, spending the time doing the research, the reading, and assembling it and putting it all together in a format where people can easily uh, assimilate what's uh, People could get all of your books on Amazon. Yeah, they're all on Amazon. Amazon either in paperback or Kindle, so, and a number of other sources, so. Yeah. Nook. Mm -hmm. Nook. Yeah. <laughs> ebook or you know PDF files on Lulu and things like that. Oh so my gosh! Yeah, you yeah, name try it. Try to cover the bases. That's fantastic. They could actually probably go to your website, look up uh, all those different books that you've published. And yeah, each book has its own page. You just go down, and at the bottom there's so many different links where people can get the uh, books. Because now. Um, as many people know, Amazon's also in England, Sweden, or Denmark, Italy. Uh, so it's uh, in a variety of places, Canada, yeah. and they're also beginning to work on opening up in India as well. So, That's amazing. You know, so that yeah. basically means any of those outlets can be used to purchase the books in the local currency. Yeah. So that's nice. So you, you, pretty soon you're just going to be sitting. That's. <laughs> <laughs> kind of what I'm doing already. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> Which is nice because now I can, you know, I've got the time, I've got the facility where all I have to do is just uh, producing the books and stuff and doing the research and uh, I don't have to, you know, worry about much else. But and I mean, you like any, you say. You could also be anywhere in the world. Yeah, that's another point, you know, but I also keep my life very simple. Yeah. So, you know, I don't need a lot to uh, uh, live and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. So. But you've been a, a major world traveler, and uh, yeah. especially to India. Yeah, I've been all over India. People ask me, especially Indians, oh, you've been to India? Oh, yes, yeah. yes. It's easier to tell you where I haven't <laughs> been. I haven't been to Tripura, Meghalaya, or Mizoram. Oh, Otherwise, wow. I've been in every state of India, sometimes several times, in fact. So, you know. So, uh, <laughs> you know, apart from having been steeped in the Indian philosophy, Vedic philosophy for, for over 40 years, mm -hmm. um, you're also uh, now have become a big expert and on the historical significance of India and its contribution to practically every type of uh, subject and uh, tell us about that. That's what the book's about. This is the book, yeah, this is the book that covers that area. In fact, I try to keep each book covering particular areas, whether it's a spiritual philosophy, the history, or whatever. And this is, goes back and explains how the ancient Indian advancements were some of the original advancements that uh, provided for the inventions that we enjoy today. In fact, Einstein was the one that said, uh, we have to thank India for at least teaching us how to count. Now, what that means is, is that the early tradition, they, they were very strong in mathematics. In fact, most of the uh, geometry, algebra, things like that that we uh, use today originally came from India. And they're very good in uh, architecture and astronomy. Yeah. So this is what they use the advanced uh, mathematics for. But in, for example, Egypt, Rome, Greece, which was considered like the seed of Western uh, culture, right. but even China, they had taken their systems of mathematics to as far as they could go with it. In other words, they couldn't advance any further until they finally got what became known as the Arabic numerals, which were actually uh, script, uh, uh, numerals coming from the Brahmi script from India, yeah. which was an offshoot of uh, Sanskrit. So the Arabs got it from the Indians. The Arabs got it from the Indians, and they knew that because even they called it the al arkan al-Hindu, which means the Indian uh, number system, yeah. or Hindi stock, which also means the Indian art. So they knew they got it from India. And then the scholars, the Arabic scholars, were very fascinated by the uh, numerical system and the mathematics that came from India. So they translated the Sanskrit literature into their language, which was later translated into uh, Latin, which then 
uh, entered from Arabia into Southern Europe and then expanded throughout Europe and became known as the Arabic numerals. Yeah. Which is a, 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 you know, a misnomer, really, because they're not Arabic numerals at all. They right. originally came from India, so they should be called the Indic numerals. What I was really amazed of, uh, reading your book also, and I've heard about this surgeon before, was it Shushruta? Mm -hmm. uh, they had hundreds of different, and I got this right from your book, hundreds of different medical instruments mm -hmm. for hundreds of different medical procedures, including plastic surgery. Right. In fact, the English were, were the ones to originally find out and learn from the Indians how to replace the nose or the damages on a nose. And they recorded the uh, operation as they witnessed it by the Indian surgeons and then duplicated that back in England later on. So a lot of this stuff, the surgeries, the instruments which they used thousands of years ago are not that different from the ones we have today. Yeah. And uh, so Shushruta and uh, others were the ones that initiated and written about. Remember, yeah. the Vedic system was an oral system. So whatever was written means it was written after the tradition had been going on for hundreds if not thousands of years. Yeah. So the point of it is, is that a lot of this stuff that came out of India only gradually then entered into the Western civilization later on and was used thereafter. So basically when it comes to the advancements, whether it's surgery, medicine, Ayurveda, even botany, the science of agriculture and rotation water conservation, water collection and preservation, uh, textiles, shipbuilding, all these things were already there in India which were far advanced more than any other part of the world at the time. And yeah. uh, even when the British came to India, they noticed how the shipbuilding that was going on in India was far superior to their, to their own shipbuilding it, right. because the ships could be sometimes three times bigger than their biggest ones and they would last three times longer without any maintenance. Sometimes, because in the British ships, they would last uh, roughly about 30 years, and then you'd have to really put in a lot of maintenance. Whereas the Indian art of shipbuilding, their ships could last anywhere up to 90 years without any maintenance. Incredible. So they were far advanced yeah. in all these different things. Plus, the early Vedic scripture also talks about, which is known to go back at least 5,000 years ago, is known to talk about how they had been already undergoing. Uh, ocean-going journeys for trade, uh, transportation, things like that. So I remember in one of your other books even uh, talking about the connection between the Indians and the Mayans and the Aztecs. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Now, what also uh, is going to really shock people is that uh, the Wright brothers were not the first to fly. No, no, not <laughs> at all. Not at all. Even the concept of uh, flight goes back... Uh, well, at least 5,000 years. You have it mentioned in the Mahabharata. You have it mentioned in the, uh, uh, the, many of the Puranas. Uh, and they go all, all go back thousands of years ago. So the whole concept of flight uh, has been there for thousands of years. The thing of it is, then you have the, what's called the uh, Vimana Shastra, which also goes into detail of how the different mechanisms for flight are built put together, described, uh, what kind of food you need for flight, uh, what kind of uh, clothing you need to be in these uh, uh, vimanas, as they were called. Yeah. So how was all this detail assembled unless there was not some kind of uh, ongoing operation for flight? Right. I mean, there is quite detail in terms of the machinery, how it works, right? Exactly. In, in, these, yeah. in these scriptures, which are... Uh, how many years old? I mean, well, at least at least uh, five thousand. Most people, that's most uh, most Sanskrit experts <coughs> that are aware of this culture uh, place uh, the original text at least five thousand years back. So, um, and uh, even I know Carl Sagan mm -hmm. uh, was saying how these Vedic literatures are the only ones that give incredible detail in terms of cosmology. And, uh, you know, even the fact of our comprehension of the expanding and then the retracting mm -hmm. universes, all there in the Vedic. And he was uh, particularly fascinated by the fact that the Vedic scripture was using uh, lengths of time uh, that were similar to modern science. Wow. He couldn't, uh, you know, well, he definitely had a high appreciation for the fact that it, the, the ancient Vedic system was very similar to 
the uh, uh, modern scientific terms and lengths of time and things like that that we use today. And uh, also in terms of distances of the planets. Right. Yeah, I mean, to the, you know, nth, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The Surya Siddhanta talks about the, uh, the uh, space or the uh, distance between the sun and the earth or the moon and the earth and the uh, circumference of the earth, and which are all very similar, very close to what we have found today. Now, how did they know that back then? Yeah. Obviously, the Indian culture, the Vedic tradition especially, which I especially write about in this book here, was much more further advanced than uh, we often give it credit for. So this book does a couple things. First of all, for those that are interested in history, they'll find all these different stories, these different tales, and the evidence within the book, but also it gives us uh, the opportunity to place credit where credit is due. Just like I mentioned Einstein, giving yeah. credit to India for teaching us how to count. The point of it is, if we did not use those advancements from India, many of the things that we enjoy today, whether it's electricity, computer, uh, computers, uh, all these different, uh, or even now watching us on television, yeah. this probably would not be possible without adapting some of the technological advancements that originally came from India. I think one of the great things uh, that your book is uh, going to be contributing to is, is you know, previously, that Eastern philosophy culture was pretty much denigrated by my own countrymen, the British. You know, that's right. Yeah. That's right. In so fact, it was the British, and I explain this very clearly in the book. That it was the British who came to India, learned the uh, how advanced the British shipmaking uh, business was, and put laws into effect when they were uh, not only in Britain but also in India, which gradually. Uh, decimated the shipbuilding business in India. Yeah. In other words, their whole operation was to manipulate the system in such a way as to, uh, you know, if I can yeah. may say, denigrate the and culture the and the Indian ma uh, advancements to the point where they could still can maintain superiority or so-called yeah. superiority yeah. over the culture of uh, Indian and the Indian civilization itself. But we all know what happens to those great empires. They don't last that long. They go up or they go down. And that is the law. That's the law of nature. Yeah. Exactly. So so I, Lord I, Curzon actually also said that too. Yeah. He said that we need to understand how important India is to our uh, empire because without India, England would simply be a very small uh, operation. And basically, that's what's happened <laughs> <Yeah>. since then. <laughs> Well, again, <laughs> we've been with Stephen Knapp. It's an amazing book. I read it cover to cover, Advancements of Ancient India's Vedic Culture. You can get it, uh, learn about it on his website, go to Amazon. But I would recommend all of his books because they are so interesting. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank Norma Housie and the Labyrinths. Again, go to Norma's website, and you can find out how you can experience the labyrinth. And once again, Stephen, thank you. Okay. for joining us on the show. Thank and, you. And uh, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us on Out of the Ordinary into the Extraordinary. Don't forget, God is alive and magic is afoot. <laughs>